Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the seventh webinar in the RUS series. Uh, my name is Teresa, and I will be guiding you through this webinar. Uh, so this is a special edition, as it is given as a part of the second International Electronic Conference on Remote Sensing. And moreover, the topic was chosen to match uh, with the conference on mapping water bodies from space that has been held last week in Ezrin, Frascati, Italy. Uh, so, as you probably all know, since you're attending, the topic of this webinar uh, will be how to map uh, water bodies using optical and SAR data, and how this service can, you, can help you when, you, um, when working with Sentinel data. So, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, and you will be able to repeat the exercise by yourself. Uh, I will explain the details a little bit later. So let's start. Uh, one more thing. I would ask you to post your questions into the quest questions tab immediately when you have them. There's quite a lot of us today, so in order to um, not have such a backlog of questions for the Q&A session that will be following this webinar, I would ask you to uh, post them immediately and me and my colleagues will try to answer you uh, as soon as we can. Okay, so first, let me give you a quick overview of what we are going to be doing today. So first, I will tell you a little bit about the study area. Then, I will tell you a little bit about the data that we will be using. Then, I will give you a short introduction to the risk service. Then, we will move on to the exercise itself. And then, we will have approximately 20 minutes to the, for the Q&A session. So, the total duration of, the web, of this webinar, I would expect one and a half hours. Okay, so first the study area. So as this topic is uh, mapping water police from space, we have chosen as our study area the Mazurian Lake District in northeast of Poland. And um, this district um, is um, comprises of more than 2,000 lakes shaped by mostly by glaciers during the Pleistocene Ice Age. Uh, most of the lakes are uh, quite small and shallow, and some of the some of them have um, coastal areas covered with vegetation, as you can see on the pictures. Okay, so for this we will be using um, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. So first, few words about Sentinel-1. The mission comprises of two polar uh, orbiting satellites in the same orbit, faced at 180 degrees to each other. They are named Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B. They both carry the identical uh, active sensor in band C. And they have very short revisit time approximately maximum of four, day, four days at the equator. However, for the acquisitions to be done in the same geometry, meaning the same orbit, it's six days with the two satellites and 12 days with only one satellite. They provide all weather day and night acquisitions in four different imaging modes with different swath and resolution. Uh, today we will be using using the interferometric white swath, which has a resolution of 5 by 20 meters, but resembles to pixel size of 10 meters, and swath width of uh, 250 kilometers. The second satellite that we will be, second source of data that we will be using today is Sentinel-2. The Sentinel-2 is an optical instrument, or carries an optical instrument that acquires data in 13 of 13 bands. Again, uh, it's a mission. It has uh, it comprises of satellite, satellite Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B. Again, they are in polar orbit, faced 180 degrees to each other. As I said before, the data are acquired in 13 spectral bands uh, with three different resolutions. So the basic bands or optical bands, um, so blue, green, red, and infrared, are acquired at 10 meter resolution. Then we have the red edge bands and short wave infrared bands at 20 meter resolution, and then the atmospheric or bands ori oriented to atmosphere composition at 60 meters. Approximate revisit time is five days at the equator. Okay, so now a few more uh, words about the RUS service. Uh, so RUS stands for Research and User Support for Sentinel Core Products, and it is an initiative funded by the European Commission and managed by the European Space Agency with the objective to promote the, the uptake of Copernicus Sentinel data and support R&D activities. The service provides free and open scalable platform in a, with a powerful virtual machines uh, that host a suite of uh, open source toolboxes uh, that are customized to the user's requirements. So these, here you can see some of the toolboxes that the virtual machines by default include, which could be SNAP, QGIS, R, 
uh, or Python and many others. The virtual machines are usually accessed through a, a browser, uh, which I will show you a little bit later. Okay? And they should be ready to use, of course, for the users and they can be customized to their needs. As I have said before, uh, it hosts a source of open source toolboxes that are installed on the virtual machines, but also we provide a specialized remote sensing help desk to answer any questions you might have about uh, processing of data, selection of data for different applications and so on. Uh, we also provide webinars, as you know, and face-to-face -face events and various conferences or organized by ourselves to teach uh, users how to use uh, Sentinel uh, Copernicus data. Okay? So I'll just show you two uh, websites that are um, related to this project. So first, you probably already know, it's the Roost Training webpage where you have registered for this webinar. Okay, so when you um, access this website, you can uh, you see that you have two options. You can go to training or e-learning. Um, let's have a quick look to the training. You can see upcoming and past trainings. So for upcoming, we have at the moment some face-to-face -face events that we are that are being organized, such as uh, next week an event at uh, EGU uh, in Vienna, or next event uh, where we are participating in the transatlantic course. Um, organized in Zagreb, uh, so you can also find more information about these events uh, and how to register for them and so on. Also, at the moment we do not have any webinar here in, in the list, but um, if you go to the past events, you can see uh, information about our past webinars, including already this one, uh, and uh, when you access the page, you can, see the you can find the recording of the webinar and Q&A document that was where all the answers to questions that we thought were uh, interesting or important during the Q&A sessions uh, will be listed and also the questions that we didn't manage to answer during the short Q&A sessions that we had. So you can find all of that here and you can replay the webinar. And on, in addition, you can repeat, you can find information about how to repeat the exercise. You can also access the e-learning page that we have, which provides courses at the moment only for SAR. Um, so it's an introduction, it's a series of courses for introduction to SAR, uh, remote sensing with quizzes and um, lectures. So I would invite you to, um, to try to participate in our e-learning course. The next step page that is also very important is the riscopernicus.eu. And that is the web page where you can uh, request we can, you can register and request for the free virtual machine that I have described before. This is the layout of the page. You can find out what Bruce uh, is, who is behind it, and how does it work. You can also find information about the computing environments and trainings and so on. So if we go to computing environments, you can uh, see the full list of tools available on the platform, and you can also see information about the ICT resources we provide. So we generally divide um, work environments to three different levels. Uh, it's level A, B, and C, and they differ in uh, the number of processors, disk space, and duration for which they are provided. However, it always depends, as I said, the environments are customized to the user's needs, so it always depends on uh, what your project is about and what you require to do your research project or just repeat a webinar or so on. So, um, if you um, do not have a Roos account yet, um, you need to uh, click here on Login Register and go to Register for Copernicus SSO account, which will redirect you to the ESA uh, CDS SSO single sign-on registration, where you have to fill in your details um, and, um, of course, click Register. And uh, following that, you will receive three separate emails. So, only after these three emails, uh, you are fully registered and you can access to that page. So remember, it's three emails, not just one. Unfortunately, as your registration needs to be checked by a um, human operator, it might take up to um, 24 hours or 48 hours. So once you get your um, activation email, so the third one, you can go um, to the login and register again and login into uh, your new account. So I already have an account, so I did not register, but I will just log in. And once you log in, you can see that you have a new tab here that shows you your profile, your training, and also your dashboard, which is the most important part that we will be looking into. Um, and here you have a list of virtual machines that, I, that have been created and are assigned for you. I already have two. Um, of course, uh, you as a new user will not have any. 
and you can request a new user service using this button. So I'll just walk you quickly through the, how the request works. Um, so we will have three sets of questions for you. It's quite quick. Um, so the first question would be how many years of experience in remote, remote sensing do you have? Let's just choose some uh, data that may not remain empty. Um, then, have you already downloaded Copernicus data via Copernicus Open Access Hub? Yes. Have you already handled and processed Copernicus data? Yes. And this is an important part. So, do you wish to practice within RUS virtual environment a tutorial exer or exercise shown in the RUS webinar or in RUS sub training material? Um, so, at the end of this webinar, and for those who have already attended different web, um, our other webinars, uh, you know that at the end of this, um, of this webinar, you will receive code that you can input here, such as, for example, for our last uh, webinar, I believe the code was LAN04. Um, so you can input this code to let our help desk know which um, data or which webinar you uh, wish to repeat, and we will upload the data related to this webinar including a step-by-step -step guide to your virtual machine. So um, then you have to choose if you only want to repeat um, the tutorial exercise and you don't need any other data sets or tools, or if in addition to the exercise, you also plan to use uh, your virtual machine for another project, research or R&D activities. And you require um, additional Copernicus data. Okay, so for us, um, let's say we require additional Copernicus data. And let's click Next. Here you have to uh, define a little bit the project that you wish to perform. So for us, we will go for Hydrosphere. What kind of operations do you wish to perform on RUS? Um, you, can, you have several uh, levels of uh, difficulty of the tasks you want to perform. For us, we will say basic processing of Copernicus data using RUS tools. Um, then you have to select uh, your preferences for the data download, downloading process. So you have two options. Either you can uh, use the self-downloading, or you can download the data yourself with our support, uh, or you can use the RUS downloading service. service sorry. Um, so if you prefer this mode, um, the RUS operator will handle the uh, download of the data on your behalf and preload them on your virtual machine. So for us, let's choose self-downloading. And then um, you need to describe your foreseen activities and support needs on the virtual machine. So you can, for example, mention the VM size, you prefer uh, RAM, um, that you prefer specific tools and software that you would prefer to have on the virtual machine. And then our help desk will assess it and let you know if this is all available. Then you just enter the name of your project. So I will not enter anything here, but since the field cannot remain empty, I will just select this and click next. So this is the last page in the, in the request for the virtual machine, and here you need to specify the Earth observation data that you need. Uh, first, what type of Earth observation data you need. So for us, it will be Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. You may or may not give further details of what kind of data you want. Uh, want to use. Then um, you need to define uh, your region of interest. So as I said, we will be looking at uh, northeastern Poland. And then you can also import this um, regi region of interest as a shapefile uh, with maximum size of 5 megabytes. And on, on the shapefile, so it has to be a zip file containing a single shapefile containing a single polygon. So it's a bit complicated, but actually not so much. So uh, do we want to perform a multi-temporal analysis? Yes or no? So for us, no. And any additional specifications that you might have about your projects uh, and the data that you require for it. OK, so now we click uh, Submit and Review. So here there is a, a summary of your entire request. So um, when you are submitting this request, you should check this uh, request very well. Then you need to agree to uh, our terms and conditions, which are generally very simple. I would advise you to, uh, well, I would invite you to have a quick read through them. And then you click on Submit Request. I already have virtual machines, as you have seen, so I will not submit this, this request, actually. So I will now go um, back to my dashboard. 
and once uh, your virtual machine is issued, uh, you will uh, see, as I do, here the table where you will have one uh, virtual machine and you can ask for support for your processing task if you have any specific questions about uh, which data to use, how to process them, and so on and so on. Um, and you can close your surface, of course, and you can, of course, access your virtual machine. So uh, for this webinar, we will be using this one. So I will go to access. Okay. So once your uh, virtual machine is issued, you will receive the link and the um, login uh, details to your email. Okay, now when you access, when you log into your virtual machine, you can see um, in your browser basically a remote desktop uh, with all the tools um, listed uh, with launchers in, in, on, your, on your desktop. And uh, we can start our exercise. So first step we need to do in the exercise is to, of course, download the data. Um, so uh, let's go ahead. Um, so we will download the data using the Copernicus Open Access Hub. So if you click on uh, the browser window here, you are automatically redirected to the uh, Copernicus Open Access Hub. And again, um, you have to, to download. So Sentinel data is free. However, to download them, you have to have uh, an account on the Copernicus Open Access Hub. So um, I would, for those who do not have it, I would advise to, to sign up. A few simple details. The registration in this case is immediate. Um, again, um, you have to receive the activation email, but that shouldn't take long. And once uh, you're registered, you can go to login. Okay. And we can start to search for, the, for our data. So as I had mentioned before, we will be using, um, let me just enlarge the view a little bit. Um, so we will be using Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. So we will be using data from two different satellites. We will be using one single product from the Sentinel-2 and five products for, Sent for Sentinel-1. So let's start with looking for, for our data. So we can zoom in to the approximate region of uh, interest, which is right here. To move the map, you can click on the pen mode. That was a bit too much. And then you can use the box to define your area of interest. Once you've done that, you can go to the search settings here, where you can set the sensing period. So for us, first we will look for the Sentinel-1 data. And those will be for the two summer months. So from the 1st of July to the, last, uh, to the um, 31st of August, so of 2017, sorry. So let's set these dates. So July 1st, 2017 to August 31st, 2017. Okay. Then uh, we have to select which mission we are interested in. So here you have you can find data for uh, the three different missions: so Sentinel One, Sentinel Two, and Sentinel Three. And uh, let's check Sentinel-1 for this moment. So we know in our case that we want to only look at data, look for data from Sentinel-1A satellite. So I have, of course, pre-selected this data previous to this um, exercise. So I know what um, data I am looking for. Um, then the product type will be the ground range detected. Sensor mode will be the interferometric white swath. And I also know um, which relative orbit I'm looking for. You can find the relative orbit. I will show you how uh, to find it uh, in a second. And this ensures that all the data that you uh, get in the results will be in the same geometry. Okay, so let's search for our data. And here we have the results. So it all looks like it's a one result, but actually we have five uh, different data sets. We need to download all five of them. Uh, so um, we can add them to uh, our product card or we can just click download here. I will also show you how to have a look at the properties and where to find the, um, the relative orbit information. So in this um, 
sort of a product overview. You can see the location. You can see a quick view and it's once this loads. Um, and you can also see product platform information and so on and so on. And usually um, the relative orbit information is right here. And this ensures that the data that you're downloading are from the, at the same geometry. So generally, when you're downloading from a Copernicus Open Access Hub, you can only download two products at the same time. And you can, um, you have to therefore always go and click one by one. You can also add your products into cart and use downloading utilities such as scroll or ARIA uh, to download um, this data. I will not be explaining this during this webinar. However, there is a very useful tool for downloading the data and the use of this tool is explained in the step-by-step -step guide that is provided when you want to uh, repeat this exercise. So uh, you can find all the details there. However, we have a limited time, so I will not show how to, how to do this. So generally, you would click cart. And then um, you can go and search for the Sentinel-2 data. So now let's um, search for our Sentinel-2 data. And for Sentinel-2, uh, we, as I said, we will be using only one single image. And this image has been acquired on the 16th of August 2017. So we need, we only, it's enough if we only specify that one single day. So August 16th. Also here. Okay. Then I need to unselect Sentinel 1 and select Sentinel 2 mission. And I need to select um, a level 2 product here. Um, the level 2 product has already been radiometrically and um, atmospherically corrected. Um, so the level two products are only available for, as, as of now, they're only available for Europe uh, as of April 2017, um, operationally. However, if you need to perform uh, atmospheric correction on a um, product that is outside, or if you need to process a product that's outside of Europe um, or previous to this date, you can uh, achieve the same level using the center core processor, which is freely available in SNAP. Uh, again, this will not be a topic of this webinar, but uh, you can find the steps in the step-by-step -step guide. Okay, so we will just select this. We already have our uh, area selected, and we can click for search. So in our search here, rather a lot of uh, results. We will, however, be interested only in this one. Uh, so um, the Sentinel-2 is provided uh, in tiles, and the tiles are cut uh, out of the um, original swath width. So the tiles have 100 by 100 kilometers um, size, and the one that we are interested in right here. So if I click on it, it will be highlighted um, here in the in the results section, and again I can add it to uh, the cart. Okay. In this case, I'm not interested in all the other ones. And then when I want to see what I have in my card, I can go to the profile, click on card, and I can see that I have six products in my card, so that's correct. Um, and then I can either, um, as I would do now, download them one by one, or I can download the card, which will uh, create a products.metafor file, which is then used as an input to the tools that I have um, described before. So at the moment, I will not download the data because it takes quite a while. They are rather, rather large, as you can see, and it would take a while uh, to download, and we do not have the time uh, during the webinar. So I will now go back to uh, my training folder. So usually, if you're repeating the exercise, you will know that the training folder is uh, placed in a shared, or so just the name of the folder is shared, training, and whatever the topic and name of the tutorial is. And I can see that I have all my data already pre-downloaded, so it's five Sentinel-1 images and one Sentinel-2. And now we can start with our processing. So we will do our processing in SNAP. We, in, in the Rust platform, generally we use the latest version, which is version 6. So let's open SNAP. 
and first we will process the Sentinel-2 data. Um, so the processing will be done separately on Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1, of course, because they are very different types of data. So first we will start with the optical data Sentinel-2. So let's open our first data set, which is in the original folder here. So, and let's first have a quick look at the structure of SNAP. So, on the top you have a product explorer window, in the bottom you have navigation window, um, which is very useful. So let me just um, shift into full screen view so you have a better view of what I'm doing. And let's have a look at the uh, product structure. Okay. Um, so, as I said before, uh, Sentinel-2 product consists of 13 bands. You can see that here is only number 12, but uh, be aware that there is uh, two bands 8, so band A and band 8A, A, um, which are both um, near-infrared bands on slightly different wavelengths. Um, then you can also see that it con already contains masks. For us, the most important part is SCL masks that are created during the atmospheric correction, so during the processing to the level 2 uh, data. And they already, you can see, include um, a water mask as well as uh, cloud masks, so low, low, medium and high probability of clouds, and thin cirrus mask and many others. We will have a closer look at them in a second. So first, let's have a look at our data. So first, let's, have open, let's open uh, RGB image window. So you right click on the product and go to open RGB image window. Normally we could use the natural colors, however in this case water bodies are better differentiated using the false color infrared view, so let's use in the profile, let's change to false color infrared. And you can see uh, that the bands are now, are now uh, near infrared, red and green. Click OK. This will take a few seconds because it's, the product is rather large. And there we go. So we can see that the tile is um, rather large, so it's 100 by 100 kilometers. Um, our area of interest, of course, is mostly in this area uh, of, the, of the lake district. Um, and we can see that there is many, many lakes with um, some very small, narrow, other a bit larger but generally they are quite shallow lakes. And um, now let's have a look at the masks that are provided with the product. So let's go to the uh, mask folder here in the product, product explorer uh, and to the SCL masks and let's uh, have a look if uh, I did a good selection and if I selected the product well um, because uh, the goal of course was to choose a product that uh, contains no clouds. So let's uh, have a look at the cloud high probability and medium probability and then cirrus. So you can see that there is some pixels that um, are classified as cloud uh, in the cloud masks. However, you can also see that they mostly correspond to the um, lake coast or to roads and so on and they do not really look like clouds. So they are mostly, of course it's always upon a closer examination, but in this case I'm confident that all the pixels that are here classified as clouds are actually misclassified, uh, very bright objects such as beaches, roads, tarmac surfaces and so on and so on. So there is no feature that here I would um, assume would be a cloud. Uh, also in the high cloud probability there's much fewer pixels and if we compare with the RGB view, we can see that they mostly correspond to uh, perhaps cities and uh, roads and beaches and not to um, any cloud features. Um, also, we cannot find any thin cirrus, uh, cirrus um, features, so it seems that I have done a good selection and we indeed have a cloudless uh, image. So now let's have a look uh, how does the um, default included uh, water mask perform. So if we open this, okay. Um, so here we can see that um, while the big water bodies are captured very well, we can also see a lot of misclassification. 
especially um, in cities. So build-up area, um, like such as this one, seems to be quite highly misclassified. Um, so maybe let's let's investigate if we can if we can do better in with with our mask. Okay, so uh, let's now proceed with the actual processing of the data. So what do we need to do in order to derive a cloud mask? Uh, sorry, cloud mask water mask um, from the Sentinel-2 imagery. Um, so first, uh, as I have said before, the Sentinel-2 data are not all, all the band, not all the bands have the same resolution. So we have three different resolution, resolutions and unfortunately the SNAP tools generally require all the bands of the data set to be with identical resolution. So first step that we need to do is resample the product to identical resolution. So you can do this by going to raster. Sorry, first you need to select or highlight the product in the product explorer. Then you can go to raster, geometric operations, and resampling. Okay, so we can leave the name here. Um, if you do not select here save as, the product is not going to be physically saved, but it's only going to be uh, saved into um, virtual memory or this virtual product and it's going to be deleted once you close SNAP. So in our case that's that's okay. So let's leave it like that and then go to the resampling parameters. So we have three options. We can resample by reference then from the source product or we can resample by, tar by target width and height. So um, by number of pixels to which um, the image is supposed to be divided or by pixel resolution, so such as 60 meters, 10 meters, or 20 meters, or any other value, 50 meters, for example. In our case, we will just use um, a reference band, and we will use not band 1, because band 1, if you remember from the table that I have been showing in the beginning, has 60 meter resolution, but actually for us, uh, we will be using only data that are originally with 10 meter resolution, so um, we will resample to uh, the native resolution of band 2, which is 10 meters. Um, okay, and we can click run, and a new product will appear in our product explorer, so now it has an index number 2. You can agree and close this dialog, and now I have a product here which has the suffix resampled, so that's my resampled product in which all the bands have a identical resolution. If I visualize it, it's going to look exactly the same, um, but for the purposes of this webinar, let's just quickly open a view. So open RGB window, and then now actually if I click on profile, you can see I have many more options. And this is due to the fact that now all my bands have the same resolution, so I have much many more combinations that I can choose from. Uh, before, only some bands were available or had the, exactly the same uh, resolution and I can only create an RGB image if all my bands or input ha bands have the same resolution. So now I will choose this one, which is lent water. It uses the near-infrared, short-wave infrared and red bands and gives us better separability of land and water. Okay. So now we have the image and the next thing, next step we need to do is a subset. So obviously we would not want to, um, in this case, process the entire image, but we would like to subset it to uh, the area of interest. And we can do this by again highlighting the product here and again going to raster, subset. And here we can choose from three different ways. So we can do a spatial subset, a band subset, or metadata subsets. For us, at this point, we will only do bands, uh, sorry, spatial subset, and we will use pixel coordinates. Since we are subsetting one single product, pixel coordinates are okay. However, if we were subsetting multiple products in different geometries, we would certainly need to use geo coordinates to subset the product in a lot long. Okay, so for us, um, let's select some values here, and you can see that once I click here, the blue line here defining the subset is going to be moved, so it's showing me where my subset, my current subset as I've set it. Okay, so this is my final subset. I can also see the uh, estimated 
size and I can click OK again. This data now is not physically saved on your disk, it's only a virtual product and if you want to uh, do any further operations with it, you do need to um, save it physically. So um, let's, if you want to do that, so let's do that. Um, right click on the product and click save product. Okay. So uh, here I have a warning that this might take a while. And again, uh, it will let me choose a specific folder. Sure. Training. And we are processing sentence two, so I will set it to sentence two. And I would save the product here. Again, as you've seen in the warning, this can take a couple minutes maybe, or a minute. Um, so I will not actually do that here because that might be quite boring for you. And I will just cancel here and actually open the product that I have pre-processed and saved for this purpose. Okay, so now here we have the product as if we saved this one. So I can have a look. It still has my 13 bands, masks, including cloud mask, everything as uh, we had before. And now uh, let's calculate, uh, let's create our mask. So in this case, we will be using the normalized difference water index. And the NDWI is widely used band ratio method that has been developed to delineate open water features and enhance their presence in remotely sensed, sensed optical imagery. Um, the NDWI makes use of reflected infrared inf uh, radiation and visible green light to enhance the presence of such features, open water bodies, while eliminating the presence of soil and terrestrial vegetation features. So let me just very quickly show you a slide that I have uh, to better illustrate this. We go. So here you can see on this graph, you can see the general reflectance of, or the uh, reflectance uh, in, um, in the spectrum um, of uh, bare soil, vegetation, or reflectance profile of soil with the green vegetation and water. So you can see that the highest reflectance um, of water is generally in the green part of the spectra, while in the near infrared, a majority of the, uh, of the radiation is, uh, is um, absorbed, and therefore um, it is uh, almost a zero uh, reflected radiation. Of course, all is dependent on the water constants. So, for example, if you have um, vegetation in the water, or if you have high chlorophyll content, high, tur high turbidity, and so on and so on. So the normalized different water index um, uses the green part of the spectra, in this case band 3, or in Sentinel-2D that corresponds to band 3, and the near infrared which corresponds to band 8. Um, and generally if you are familiar with the um, normalized different vegetation index, it looks very much similar, um, or the whole um, concept is similar. Um, and then you can classify using this index. So if um, the value uh, of the resulting uh, image is, or value of the resulting pixel is uh, lower than zero, then generally we can assume it corresponds to land. Um, and if um, it's higher than zero, we can uh, assume that it corresponds to open water. So let's go back to our processing and let's actually uh, perform um, this calculation. So first, let's just quickly open bands that we will be using. So it's band 3. I can open the view by double-clicking, so we will also see our subset. And band 8. And I will close the previous view. Okay, so this is our subset, and you can see that the reflectance um, of the water surfaces is very rapidly different in the band 3 and in the band 8. So in band 3, we can see that actually some sur water surfaces are, um, the reflectance is quite high um, and they appear quite light on the picture as compared to, for example, forested areas here. And in band 8, in near infrared, all our water bodies have very, very low reflectance and appear almost black. So let's calculate the, the index. And we can do this by uh, right-clicking on the product number 4 here and going to map, band map. And let's set a name for the new band that we will be calculating, which is NDWI. 
let's unclick the virtual because we want to actually physically save this band. Click edit expression and we can build our expression using the tools that we have in this. So band 3 minus uh, band 8 divided by the sum of both which is band 3 plus band 8. Okay, so let's click OK. We, we had the green sign that there is no errors in our formula, so all the bands are accounted for, and we can click OK. And now we can see that a new band has been created here in our uh, band list, and we can see that the water bodies now appear very, very bright. So if I go to uh, my histogram, which is available in uh, color, uh, color manipulation tab here, um, we can see um, that there is majority of the surfaces here are in negative values, while um, the water bodies appear as positive values here. So we have sort of a bimodal, maybe trimodal histogram, but uh, we are only interested in the two uh, peaks. Okay, so what we can do next is to create a water mask. Um, so how do we do this? We can again use the, um, the bank mask operator to create a threshold and then binarize our uh, NDWI index into water surfaces and non-water surfaces. So let's call it NDWI ma wa mask. And click virtual again, go to expression, and now um, let's define the expression. So it's going to be a conditional statement, which in SNAP you can uh, find here. So if you go to operators, then you can see that here um, you have uh, the preset structure of the conditional statement and the at signs you replace with, um, with uh, the values. So, okay. so we have to say that our condition will be, uh, you can find all your bands here. Sorry about that. Let me maybe write it from the beginning. That was just to show you the structure of the command. So if NDWI band. So here you can see the four before the band corresponds to the index number of the band here is larger than zero. Then we want to assign one. Else we want to assign zero. So now um, this command will classify our image into a binary image where um, all values that are in the in original NDWI band higher than zero will be assigned one and all other values will be assigned zero. Okay, so here we have our um, water body mask, um, the first one uh, created for, by a very simple method. This method, of course, is not uh, completely uh, foolproof. It has um, advantages and disadvantages. We will have a look at them a little bit later when we compare both methods. So now what we would like to do is actually export um, this mask, which I misnamed, I can see now, um, which um, we will export into a GeoTIFF so we can later compare both of our masks derived from Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 in QGIS. So let's go here to File, Export, um, and GeoTIFF. And here we can click on Subset. Ah, and I forgot to do one more thing. So now I created new bands in my product, and I cannot export them unless I save them physically. So while I chose them not to be virtual bands, but to be physically safe bands. I actually have to first save the product as is here. So the bands are written into, um, into the product, and then I can export them into GeoTIFF. And then we can export. So let's go here to export as GeoTIFF, subset, 
And here we do not actually want to do um, a spatial subset, but we will want to do a band subset. So I'm not actually interested in exporting any other band than the mask band. So I will select here none, and then I will go below and only select the NDVI mask band. Click OK. And I can re rename my um, final product as S2 water mask and click export product. So this is a binary mask, so the export is very quick. Um, and then, so I'm done with the processing of the Sentinel-2 image. The mask is exported and we will have a closer look at it in a minute. And now we will move to processing of Sentinel-1 data. So let's close SNAP because SNAP generally um, has problems with releasing the memory. So if I just close the um, the product here, the memory will not be released and uh, I might run out. So I will just click, I do not want to save any of the intermediate product and I will close snap and reopen it again. New. And there we go. Now actually let's move to the Sentinel-2. So I can import my five Sentinel-2 products from original again where I have downloaded them. I can select all five and import. So now you see we have five products and processing them one by one would be a bit time consuming. So um, we will use the uh, batch processing tools that are available in SNAP. Let's just first open a view of one of them. Okay. So here we have the view on the image. It's much larger than our Sentinel-1, uh, Sentinel-2 tiles. Tile, sorry. Um, and you can see that our area of interest is approximately here. And you can also see that it's, the image appears to be upside down. So at the moment, the um, data are in radar geometry, and they are um, shown on the screen. Um, the pixels are ordered as they were acquired, so they are not uh, actually projected into any co uh, coordinate system. So uh, this uh, was uh, acquired during an ascending pass, so the pixel, um, the first pixel in the south was acquired, it was this one, and it was acquired first. Therefore, it's shown as the pixel, I would say, in coordinates 1-1 one, one, uh, on this image. So that's why it appears upside down, because here we have um, the coastal area. So um, let's um, see how we can do the batch processing. So batch processing in um, SNAP can be do, done uh, using the batch processing tool here. But first, what we need to do is design a step-by-step -step processing graph. So let's do that. So first let's uh, click on the graph builder. And at the moment we only have two uh, operators present here. So what we can do now is to uh, add other operators that we want to, um, other operations that we want to, that we wish to perform on all the five products and then save the graph and process all five products at once. Okay, so for Sentinel-1, um, grand range detected products such as we have here, generally uh, we apply several steps. So first we would like to subset the product to um, only have the area of interest and then not to process the whole image as that would be very, very time consuming. So to add this subset operator we right click to uh, the white space and uh, we go to raster, geometric and subset. And this operator will appear. I can just positioning, dragging it by my mouse. The next step will be to apply an orbit file. And that we can do in radar, apply orbit file. And uh, why do we do this? So the orbit state vectors provided in the metadata of the SAR product are generally not very accurate and can be refined uh, with the precise orbit files which are available days to weeks after the generation of the product. Um, and the orbit uh, file provides accurate satellite position and velocity information, improving the analysis that requires satellite information to be as precise as possible. So this is an important step that we need to do in most applications. Let's make the window a little bit bigger. Then the next step that, step we need to perform is uh, thermal noise removal. So again, radar, radiometric, thermal noise removal. So uh, the thermal noise in SAR imagery is the background energy that is generated by the receiver itself. 
and it skews the radar reflectivity towards higher values, and it hampers the precision of the radar reflectivity estimates. So the level one products provide a noise uh, lookup table for each measurement data set, uh, and provide, they are provided in linear power, which can be used to remove, remove the noise from the product. So again, we will input, we import an operator, and the next step will be calibration. Again, go to add radar radiometric calibration. And the last step that we will perform will be terrain correction. So just a few words to the calibration as well. Um, the objective of it, of SAR calibration, is to provide imagery in which the pixel values can be re directly related to the radar backscatter of the scene. And the uncalibrated SAR imagery is sufficient for qualitative use, but uh, calibrated SAR images are essential if we want to um, put the data into qualitative use. So in this case, actually, the values of our pixels matter to us because we will be doing a thresholding on them. So we do need to calibrate our data uh, going forward. The, the next step is terrain correction. The last step is the terrain correction. And again, we can go to add radar geometric terrain correction, terrain correction here. So now we have the line of our steps. We need to connect them. So to do this, you can either um, go to the right of each operator and drag it to whichever operator uh, is the next in line, or you can right click and select connect graph, which will automatically connect them, not in logical line, but well, uh, not um, if you have one operator here and one here, then the uh, connect automatic connection tool will not know how to connect. So it has, if it's in a line like this, uh, we can connect them automatically. And here you see that you have tabs corresponding to each of these operators, and we can set parameters there. However, uh, if we are using um, this in a batch processing mode, we do not actually want to change any parameters here, because then what happens is that usually um, this graph then doesn't work in the batch processing mode. So the only thing that we need to do now is to save the graph. So we click, click Save here and save as my graph, for example. Click Save into our S1 processing folder. Close the whole window and then we can go to Tools, Batch Processing. And um, the Batch Processing window first asks us what are our input and output parameters. So we can use this tool here to load all the currently open products in the Product Explorer. So let's click here. Let's refresh so we can get all the information from um, the acquisition, the type of the data, the orbit, and so on and so on. And here we can also see where is the uh, output directory, so where our uh, processed products will be saved. And we can also select if to keep the source product name. So for, in our case, we can keep it. Um, that means that our input product, output product will have the same name as our input product. So if you're saving them in the same folder, this uh, cannot be done because then uh, your input products will be rewritten or overwritten, but in our case we will be saving them to the S1 processing folder and our original products are in the um, original folder, so um, we don't need to worry about that. Then we click on load graph here and we go to the S1 processing folder and uh, where, where I've saved the graph and we can click on my graph XML and all the tools that are all the operators that I have selected in my step-by-step -step process are now loaded here. So now we can go and actually set the parameters. So first step is to set the subset. So in this case, we will only use, um, we can also, here we can do in one uh, the band subset and the spatial subset. So here we will do band subset also because uh, we will only be using VH polarization uh, as it offers a better separability for um, water surfaces. So let's just select. We can select two bands by holding shift. We can select these two bands, and those will be the only ones going further to the other processors. Then, here we want to actually use geographic coordinates. As I said, we have multiple products, so it's safer to use geographic coordinates in this case. And these have to be given as a polygon in the well-known text format. Um, which I will 
open here. So I have a little file here called subset info. Um, and the polygon that I have created, so it corresponds to the exact uh, outline of the Sentinel-2 subset that we have used. And I can pass it in here and I can click update. See that now is a yellow point appeared here and we can zoom in. And we can see the original extent of the five products that we have as well as the subset size. Okay, so our subset is now defined. Um, and we can go to apply orbit file. Here we do not need to change any details. We can just leave the default values, thermal noise removal as well. And we select again the VH polarization and we make sure that uh, here ther remove thermal noise is checked instead of uh, reintroduce thermal noise. Then we go to calibration um, and again we can leave all the uh, default values. We want to have a, we want to have an output as a sigma naught or backscatter values. And then the last step is uh, terrain correction. So in terrain correction we use a digital elevation model to correct uh, from SAR geometry to to a projected um, to, um, to assign a coordinate system and project and correct for effects such, an, uh, such as SAR overlay and so on. So here we need to select a map projection. Um, we will select here the same projection as uh, is used for the Sentinel-2 tile, which is a UTM uh, zone. We can do this by going here in the custom CRS and scrolling down. And SNAP has this nice feature that it allows you to um, for the zone to be automatically selected. So we select this UTM uh, slash uh, VGS84 automatic, which automatically checks the position of your image uh, and selects which zone it should be assigned to. So it's zone 34. And that's all we need to change here. We are using the SRTM 3 second uh, DM to correct our data. And now we can select run. Just one thing, we need to check here um, if we are saving this to the appropriate folder and we can click. We can click run. Again, this will take some minutes, approximately can take 10 minutes to process these five files as they're quite large. So we will not do this now. I will load instead of files that I have uh, pre-processed before. Okay, so um, I will not click run, but I will just click close and load my files from the folder. Okay, so here um, all the files that I pre-processed are saved in a, uh, in a SNAP native format, which is called SNAP DIMM, and uh, they contain a folder and a DIMM file, which is sort of a header file for the product. So I only want to select the header files from uh, the processed files, so I'll do this, and then I'll just click here. And I can actually close the original five files that I processed. There we go. Okay, so let's now see. So now my products are only containing one single band, which is sigma naught uh, underscore bh. And if I open them in view, okay. So what we can see here is that it's not quite oriented the same way, or it can seem that it's not oriented the same way as my Sentinel-2 image, which was, which was a perfect rectangle. This is due to the fact that I have used the same subset, but I have applied the subset before uh, doing the terrain correction and reprojection of the images. So um, the, all the full extent of the subset that I applied is actually here, so it would be like this. But I have also some uh, other areas that have been added to make it uh, square at the, at the point where uh, I was doing the subset. Okay, um, so first what we need to do is now, why do we actually process five images? I don't think I have mentioned this before, but Sentinel-1 or SAR imagery in general contains a lot of speckle. So if we zoom in, you can see that surface is sort of uh, salt and pepper, while you can see very well the lakes still, the details are a little bit blurred by this effect. So what we want to do in this case, uh, is we do not want to actually apply any speckle filtering because it will cause a degradation of the resolution. Uh, we want to uh, create a mean out of these two summer month acquisitions. 
which will give us much better detail for our for our church holding. So first thing we need to do is actually um, to add all of these pro products into a single core registered stack. So to do this, we have to go to radar, core registration, and just go just click core registration, and this is the core registration processor. It looks a lot like the batch processing tool that we've seen before. You can again click to import all products, refresh. And here I would advise to um, check the order of your products here and reorder them so they correspond to the timeline. So I need to reorder them just a little bit. Unfortunately, you always have to click on the product again when you want to um, reorder. So now, okay, now it should make sense. From 11th of July to 28th of August. And let's go to create stack. Here you can choose this button which uh, helps you to find the optimal master for the co-registered stack. So let's click here. So you see that the master has changed to the 8th of uh, August. And here we can choose nearest neighbor as a resampling type. Cross -cor correlation, here we will not change any parameters. Warp, here we will also not change any parameters. And right where we can select where to save our final, our final product and the, the name and the format. Again, um, this is actually very heavy processing, so again, I will not do it because it will take some minutes. So I have it prepared yet again, and I will close the dialog now and open a pre-processed product here. And that would be this one here. And let's open it. And you can see now in the bands, I don't have just a single band, but I have actually five different bands named based on the date when they were acquired. So let's just uh, have a quick look on something interesting. I can right click and I can open RGB now because they're co-registered to the same grid. Um, so let's choose RGB. So the red band will be 11th of July. The green band will be 4th of August and the blue band 28th of August. Okay. So um, this is a very interesting image because we can actually see um, it doesn't tell us much um, related to the water bodies, but it does tell us which surfaces have changed uh, between um, the acquisitions that we chose to uh, chose as the bands of the or the composite bands of the RGB. Most of these changes will actually correspond to an agricultural changes um, such as uh, harvesting of a field or so on. These sort of grayish salt. Um, and pepper um, areas mostly correspond to forests um, as there is not really that much change during this summer, summer period and you, as you can see the lakes remain with very uh, low backscatter values in general. So this is just out of interest, it doesn't really add anything to our water mass creation but just out of interest what you can do with uh, these registered stacks you can detect changes between uh, the different types of acquisition. Okay, so um, we have this. So the next step that we would do uh, would be to average this co-registered stack. So let's go to co-registration, stack tools, and stack averaging. And this tool allows us to create one single band, which is going to be the mean average of all the pixels in both bands. So let's click run. and it will create a new band in our uh, co-registered stack. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, it will uh, create a new product. Um, it took 13 seconds. And this new product will only contain one single band with the averaged values. Um, so now what I would like to do actually in order to my uh, for the masks to be comparable, I would like to subset to the same ex subset to the same extent as my Sentinel two image again. Um, but the first subset we can understand is something that we have done to uh, minimize the size of the data in order to have faster processing. Uh, but first, let's have a look. Uh, if I open views of uh, all my uh, or some of my five bands here and I also have the Sigma average uh, open here. I can go to Windows and Tile Evenly 
then I can move my view and I can zoom in. Maybe. And you can see that the um, speckle uh, filter is uh, much reduced in the um, average product or average band. So this is the average product. These are the um, single acquisition bands. Um, and we can see that the coastline, for example, is much better defined in the forest area. You get much more detail in the, or recognizable detail in the product when you do the averaging. Now we have this product. I will close all of these again. And we can actually use this, finally, the stack, to uh, apply um, some sort of thresholding. Generally, we would do the same as we have done with Sentinel-2, so apply uh, sort of a thresholding conditional statement uh, as we have applied to Sentinel-2 and EWI. Um, so how do we actually find out what is a good threshold here? Because here from the histogram we cannot really see much, and thresholding is best applied to a bimodal histogram that has two peaks, and we can select a, a good uh, separation point between those two, these two peaks. So, to bit enhance this view and the histogram, we can use, we can convert our band from linear to decibel or to, so, to a logarithmic scale, which will, which will give us much better separability. So let's click it. yes, create a new band, and let's open this new band. You can see also visually, um, it's, uh, the water bodies are much, much more enhanced in our view, and we can also see that our histogram sort of now has, seems to have two peaks uh, when converted to the logarithmic scale. So we have this little peak which corresponds to water bodies and then we have this higher peak which corresponds to the land areas. So now it should be quite better to select the separation point. So at the moment we have some um, here the gray is approximately 24, 25, minus 25 when I put like this. So this could be a good place to, uh, to select. Uh, our threshold. Uh, we could also do, um, what we could also do is draw polygons using this tool and then use them to calculate statistics. However, we are running out of time a bit, so I will not go through that. However, it is described in the step-by-step uh, -step guide and that can give you further insight on how to select uh, your threshold. Okay, so let's apply this threshold and let's go to Math again and let's say That's one mask, we select virtual, edit expression, and let's set the conditional statement if. And now we have to be careful to use the logarithmic uh, scale. Um, so sigma uh, naught underscore vh underscore db is um, smaller, smaller than minus 24. 0, then assign 1, else assign 0. Title. So uh, this is very useful um, indicator here because if you have an error in the expression it generally warns you so you can uh, check before you apply it. So now we seem to have no more errors and let's click OK. Here we have everything. We have everything set. Okay. Um, so now we can see our water mass. Okay. We can see that these um, parts have also been uh, classified as uh, as water, but that's not actually of interest to us because we will now do a further subset to be to have exactly the same subset that we had for the Sentinel two. Okay. And we will do this by. Uh, in here, then go into raster, subset again, and we will use the geo coordinates. And I have them defined here that correspond to the same subset as the Sentinel 2. So okay, so there we go. We can now see this is our final subset. Let's click OK. Can close this window and we have a new file here. And I can just quickly open 
our S1 mask. So now we can see we got rid of uh, all these uh, uh, all these uh, sites, and we uh, only have our cloud mask, and we can have a bit better look at it. So it doesn't seem as nice and smooth as the one from Sentinel-2. This is due to the fact that, as I said, Sentinel-1 has a bit uh, worse resolution. So the resolution uh, is 5 by 20 meters, although they are resampled to the same resolution, so 10 meters. Uh, but the original resolution of the product is 5 by 20. So um, it gives us a little bit less detail. Uh, but it uh, picks up very nicely also the small water bodies and we will have a look at how they compare. So what do we need to do now? We need to uh, save uh, the product and we need to uh, export uh, the band. So I've already exported the band as GeoTIFF so we can go directly to uh, QGIS but again you would do it by selecting the product, going to file, export, GeoTIFF, set your subset here and uh, export. Let's minimize this window and let's go to QGIS. There we go. So um, to visualize the differences in QGIS, um, let's import both of our products that we have exported in QGIS or uh, sorry in GeoTIFF. So we have S1 and S2. So first let's take S2 and S1. Okay. And now uh, let's just very quickly set the parameters so we have the best, uh, best view. So let's go to properties, select, at the moment it's single band gray, so let's select a uh, single band pseudo, pseudo color. Um, and let's click here on add a value. Let's change this value to 1, change the color to blue. This is very quick um, because we are um, quite late. So I'm just um, going to very quickly show you how to visualize this. Uh, then we go to transparency. We can set to 50% or 4850. And we will set 0 to uh, no data value. So this is important in order to get rid of all of these black um, fringes here. Or black no data around. And only keep the values that correspond to water pixels. OK, let's click OK. And now uh, let's do the same for the, um, for the S2 water mask. Properties. Let's go to single band pseudo color. Set to red. Transparency. We will leave full and zero, no data. Okay, so now because we set the, um, the S1 water mask to be transparent, we will have our, um, our combined area, so when the mask uh, has detected or when our processing has detected water body uh, in S1 and S2 will appear as purple, uh, and for S1 only it will appear as blue, and for S2, it will appear as uh, red. So, and last step, what we can do is uh, go to Open Layers plugin and open some sort of um, uh, background map, such as the Google Satellite. Okay. So, we can also drag it below. So, we have both of our layers below. And now we can see, actually, the differences. So, we can see that there's some water bodies that have been detected in um, S1, but has not, have not been picked up by S2. Um, or, for example, um, there is coastal areas around the water bodies that have generally, because the S2 has generally better resolution, um, the, there is less mixed pixels, or not less, but uh, we pick up more of the water area than with Sentinel-1. Uh, so with Sentinel-1, generally what can happen is that we get less, um, less area um, covered by the water body than with S2. And 
Okay, so this is just the last view. And let's go now to uh, to compare a little bit in the presentation. So I have some uh, I have a slide that uh, just to highlight the advantages and disadvantages of uh, of each of the processes. But you can see them when you have a closer look uh, at the details here. So let's go to the presentation. So here, so basically, in um, most um, times, it would be better option to select an optical data uh, to do your um, to your do your detection or water body detection. However, um, for example, when you take uh, in, when you compare the methods that we have been um, processing now, Sentinel One and EWI and Sentinel. Uh, sorry, Sentinel-2 and DWI and Sentinel-1 threshold method. Um, Sentinel, sorry, Sentinel-2 has generally better resolution. It is better in detection of water bodies or in coastal areas. Uh, however, it's affected by clouds. It can only acquire data in daytime. And many times, as we have seen on our, uh, on our comparison, it can happen that the reflection of the lake bottom or the water body bottom uh, actually causes mixed misclassification. Also, and the NDWI is known for um, having um, for uh, suffering or be affected by a build-up noise. So some build-up features have the same difference or ratio um, as water bodies. Although if you only look at them in one single band, they will appear very bright. So not dark, but very bright. However, the ratio of the band three and band eight. Uh, for these uh, build-up areas, so tarmac uh, and so on, will be similar to uh, a water body. So uh, this can cause problems. Uh, this can be mitigated, for example, by using um, the shortwave infrared instead of near infrared, or it can be mitigated by uh, mitigated by uh, introducing additional thresholds to your detection. So, for example, using NDWI plus uh, a one of a single band. Um, single band threshold such as uh, a threshold in the uh, in the near infrared or, and so on. Uh, Sentinel two, uh, so, sorry, Sentinel one. In the other hand, and the thresholding method, we can use in um, all day or uh, day and night acquisitions. So you can only have two acquisitions per day, and we can also use it in any weather. Um, however, the laser resolution is slightly lower. It is affected more by the mixed pixels along the coast. Um, it, is, it can also cause um, misclassification when there is a high winds. So if you have waves that are parallel um, to the movement of the, of the platform, of the SAR platform, um, they can cause higher backscatter and cause misclassification. And also if you have vegetation that is submerged in the water, it can cause very bright returns, so so-called double bounce, and it causes very bright return and again can cause misclassification. Uh, so you can see that both methods have uh, advantages and disadvantages. However, um, also these methods that we have shown here are uh, very basic methods. They are not. Um, there is many, many more, um, much more advanced and sophisticated methods. But for many applications, these simple methods suffice. However, we need to be aware of um, the advantages and disadvantages of each of those. Um, both of, both methods can also be used for, for example, flood mapping and so on and so on. Okay, so this is it for the exercise. I hope you enjoyed. I'm sorry for some technical problems that we had. So thank you very much uh, for attending the webinar. Remember the um, the code is uh, uh, HYDR01. You can use this to request the virtual machine with preloaded data and step-by-step -step guide for this, uh, for this webinar. So thank you very much for attending. I hope uh, you enjoyed this webinar. I'm sorry for the technical problems. And see you hopefully uh, in the next month's webinar. Um, the topic will be announced later this, this month. Thank you very much and bye-bye.